Welcome to Craft Lit, the podcast for crafters who like books. My name is Heather Wardover, and I'm podcasting from my corner of the Sonoran Desert, the Old Pueblo, Tucson, Arizona. Episode 64, A Woman of Valor. It's, uh, it's Thursday night and I was going to podcast last night, but I'll tell you, I was just completely wiped out and, uh, that seems to mirror strangely what I said to you last week. It's been one of those, I don't know what's going on. I think part of it is that I'm stressed because I'm actually coming to the end of my work work, which means I will have no income shortly, which is always a stressful thing. And I tend to carry my stress in my shoulders and my neck. And I'll tell you, this time around, I can feel it not just in the shoulders and neck, but in my wrists, which is kind of a bad thing for somebody who spends their day typing. So I spent a good chunk of my time today um, reteaching my computer my voice so that I could use uh, the headset that I am talking to you on as a, a word input device. However, in the middle of all of this, craziness. I did finally manage to get out the podcast with uh, Tom and Dan, the authors of Plato and a Platypus Walk Into a Bar. For those of you who are on iTunes and who have set it to not download explicit material, you will say to yourself, gee, that's weird. I didn't get that podcast. And the answer is, no, you didn't. And that's because a few of the jokes were on the risque side. And at one point, I think Dan said, gee, can I tell a joke? It's kind of dirty. And I said, sure, go ahead. I can put an explicit label on it. Completely forgetting that that might exclude some of you in your automatic downloading um, situation. So if you are one of those people and you'd still like to listen to it, there is no swearing. There are just kind of (laughs) slightly off-color jokes. They're a lot of fun. So that's there for you. And you may wonder, what's with the title? And I am going to get biblical on you. Uh, Becky, one of the uh, fabulous Craftlet listeners who have recorded for us in the past, she and I were going back and forth and talking about being busy people and, uh, and keeping busy and how some of the time it makes you feel really important. And, you know, just kind of the, the fact that you are in motion and there are other people who are couch potatoes around you kind of makes you a little prideful. And I wrote back and said, hey, that's not something to be upset about. And I wrote back to her with Psalm 90, verse 17. And let the beauty of the Lord our God be upon us, and establish thou the work of our hands upon us. Yea, the work of our hands, establish thou it. Which, you know, is a fancy way of saying, God likes it when you work. Uh, I, I tend to think that the work of your hands is one of those really fabulous things that you can passed down to people that creates kind of generational links. Um, Alice Walker has a wonderful essay in, I think it's in our mother's gardens. It's a a book. I'll try and find it and put it on the show notes for you. A wonderful, wonderful essay about that idea of standing on the shoulders of the women who have come before us. And while I was talking to my husband about this, he mentioned something about kind of how shocking it was to go to the Jewish Museum in New York which, if you've never been to it, it's north of the Metropolitan Museum of Art, but on the other side of the street. It's like around 82nd Street, 85th Street. It's a beautiful museum. It's one of these old stone mansions that's been converted. And you go through, and there's some wonderful, wonderful things there, but you get to this one section where you go through room after room of silver and gold items, household items. These were things that either were recovered from or were lost to and refound later. Um, the Nazis, that when they, they marched into, uh, I think a lot of the stuff that we saw was from Poland, actually, when they kind of stormed their way into Poland. It wasn't just dismantling people, you know, physical bodies. It was also dismantling homes and histories and lives. And you know, I'm, Hitler had a plan, at least this is my understanding, Hitler had a plan at one time of creating kind of a museum of dead 
races. You know, he wasn't he wasn't just going to stop with the Jews. He was working on a lot of different groups. And so they kind of wanted to have, um, we joke in Tucson about having a museum of dead things, which is a museum that some great white hunters created. It's the Natural Wildlife Museum, but it's all stuffed animals, you know, bears and water buffaloes and stuff. So it's a little on the disturbing side. But Hitler was going to do the same thing with people and, um, and wanted to have, you know, Torah scrolls and um, kiddish cups and Havdalah candle sets to show people, you know, how whacked out those, those crazy Jews were. And it struck my husband, and this is one of the reasons why I love him, as kind of important to notice that that was the worst thing the Nazis could do would be to take your kiddish cup, the, the cup that you use on, on Shabbat night when, um, when you drink wine and you break bread and, and you light your candles, taking those implements, the daily living things, the tools that make your life was one of the worst things they could do to you. And my husband noted that all of us, people who create with our hands, are working in opposition to that kind of destruction. We are creating things that the people we love will carry with them and hopefully carry with them for generations and pass on to their kids. And I just kind of loved that. And then Becky sent back to me the Woman of Valor uh, quote, which I've linked to on the website, which is translated various different ways. But my favorite is uh, the Woman of Valor has a price above rubies, which... I don't know. I just think there's something beautiful about the word and the image that comes to mind of rubies. I don't know why. I'm just that way. But that's where it came from. I'm also going to try, if I can, to get an online copy of a painting that I particularly like. It's a, a painting by, I'm looking at the postcard right now, by Jules Bastien Lepage. He's French. I don't know if you can tell from my horrible accent. <laughs> it's a painting that's at the Metropolitan Museum of All Art, although it is not on display right now, which broke my heart. But it is a gorgeous painting of Joan. And in the background, you can see three angels. Well, you can kind of see them in the reproduction. You can definitely see them when you're looking at the real thing. One is a soldier, one is a beautiful woman, and one is a baby. And they all three have halos and they're all behind her and she's gazing off into the distance transfixed and her um, spinning is behind her she's actually got a wheel swift um, that's behind her and it's impossible to tell exactly what she was doing if she was winding balls or or what but her stool has been turned over and she's clearly heard a voice speaking to her and there's just something I don't know, dramatic and melancholy and inspired in the painting. And somehow I've been in this kind of state on top of being stressed and, and having my neck hurt. I've been, I've been in this place all week and I can't figure out why. And it's not Harry Potter. But, uh, but that, there it is. There's Joan of Arc. And along with crossing the pond and going over to France, we should take a quick stop in England to listen to a listener of ours, Alice. Hello, Heather. My name's Alice. I'm 22 and I live in London. I'm having a fantastic time catching up with your Craftlet podcast, which I've been meaning to do for some time. As we've been trapped indoors while it pours with rain for the past two months, I've made it to episode 29, which I think is about November 2006. I skipped the Pride and Prejudice readings because I know the book well, but I did end up listening to most of your commentary and discussion. I've been really enjoying the short stories, and they're exactly the kind of thing that I wouldn't get around to on my own, as I tend to go for epics. You mentioned Shelley the Poet at one point, although I'm afraid I forget which episode. His middle name is pronounced Bish. It's one of those English names like Chumley. It's lovely listening to your thoughts as a change from actually reading blogs, and somehow more personal. I love the knitting content, and one day when I have fewer works in progress, I shall attempt to use a spindle. I hope your sons are doing well at school. Your elder boy sounds a bit like me at that age. I did have the advantage of being a girl, and I seem to have turned out all right. Thank you for all the time you put into your blog and the podcast. I'm looking forward to starting the return of the screw. Alice. Is 
isn't that cool? I can get voicemail from London. And Alice, boy, I hope you and your family are okay with the floods. It seems like disaster central lately between um, seeing villages that I was in and Oxford, where I lived for a summer completely underwater, which is, you know, disconcerting at best and horrifying uh, at worst. Then last night we had the horrible bridge collapse here in the States. It's, uh, it's just, you know, it feels like one thing after another again. And Alice, thank you so much for the correct pronunciation of Shelley's middle name. I, I wrote back to Alice and said, gee, you know, I think every lit teacher I've ever known has mispronounced that name. Because, you know, we always read Shelley in especially Brit lit classes, but just in general. And uh, yeah, I've never heard it pronounced correctly. So here's to Leicester Square. And Percy Bish Shelley. I f I'm mortified. In a good way. <laughs> I love learning stuff. So this is great. Um, I have some information for you. It's been a long time since I've been able to do just knitting content. We've been on these huge epic chapters. And we're going to have another couple today. But a couple more things before we head into that. One is the girl from Auntie. The woman who is responsible for doing the rogue hoodie pattern that I've talked about before and that Brenda Dane talked about early on in her podcasts. She has a widget. If you have a Macintosh computer, she has a widget called the hypotenuse widget. You can use this to calculate decreases that have a, a triangular effect to them, like if you're doing raglan sleeves and you're knitting in the round, so you just want to do decreases instead of seaming together things. She's the woman for you. So go take a look at the girlfromauntie.com website you can get that widget. We also just got a new sock pattern out for the six socks knit along. I don't know if any of you have joined that yet, but if not, it is a gorgeous Gansey sock pattern. Spectacular, nice heavy sock, good for winter. I will not be able to knit it until then. I've also been on this weird sock kick. I'm going through all of the socks that I've knit before, some of which didn't fit, fit quite perfectly, and I'm ripping out toes and re-toeing, and I'm ripping out heels and re-heeling, and I have to say, I'm feeling pretty darn proud of myself because all of the socks are fitting right now. Maybe I'm just in a fix-it mood. I don't know what it is. Um, I also have been talking on um, Ravelry with, I think it was Sue Ann in Toronto who noted something that I completely forgot to tell you, which is there is a Jane Austen movie coming out about Jane and Anne Hathaway, the girl from The Devil Wears Prada, is in it and the pictures of her in character look awesome. It looks like they actually got the period correct. I can't remember if I told you, when I took costuming at UCLA in the theater department, our final was to watch the movie Oliver and write down all of the uh, hair, makeup, and costuming mistakes in the film. And it took pages. We couldn't write fast enough to keep up with the errors in that film. So I'm highly critical when I see period pieces because it, it just drives me nuts if they're, they're off. One of the things that they're not off on is waists. I happened to see the same night that Sue Ann and I were talking, I was watching uh, The End of the Age of Innocence, and Winona Ryder, in her wedding dress, in that movie, is corseted to within an inch of her life. She must have like a 14-inch waist. It's horrifying and frighteningly realistic. That's, that's the scary thing. Man, corsets, nasty things. And the worst ones weren't the whalebone ones. The worst ones were the birdcage corsets, where they made them out of metal. Lovely. Not that, you know, people had issues with women or anything. I also wanted to alert you to a book that if you have small children, you might want to look into. It's, it's not common out there. In fact, there are very few people I've met who've read it. But Julie Andrews wrote a couple of books under the name of Julie Edwards. One was Mandy. That was her first book. The second one was The Last of the Really Great Wang Doodles. And talk about a spectacular book for kids. It's really interesting. And it it's aged pretty well. I mean, my fourth grade fifth grade, fourth grade teacher read it to us. So you know I'm 40. You can do the math. It's been a while that the book has been out, but um, sweet, sweet, interesting book. I also have on my regular mamaonits.blogspot.com blogspot blog page thing. If you go back a few days or a few weeks, actually, there is a series of videos by a comedian named Taylor Molly. And I know there are a lot of teachers who listen. 
go back and hunt for these and watch them. He's, uh, he swears, but he swears in a good way <laughs> about teachers and what it means to be a teacher and what it means to speak well. And uh, I think you will fall in love with him the way that I have. I'm um, most heavily, along with my sock knitting right now, I am most heavily into weaving. And I am trying very hard to warp the loom for a table runner for my, my dining room table. And I'm trying to make it um, huck lace. I found out from Sign Mitchell of Weavecast that my first weaving project was insane. I did it in linen, and she said she knows of actual longtime weavers who have never attempted linen. So I didn't know what I was getting myself into, and therefore I did fine. And actually the placemats I, I wove came off just fine. I keep calling it knitting because I'm so unused to weaving. And, uh, and so for my next one, I'm doing huck lace, which is easily as stupid and outrageously difficult as, uh, as my original plan. This time the difficulty is in the warping though and not the uh, figuring out how to weave part. So we'll see. I'll let you know next week uh, if this has come out at all and maybe I'll even take a picture of it. I also have two notices of things that have happened. Today is August 2nd, 2007 for those who are catching up. Interweave Press just uh, uh, released beatingdaily.com. If any of you are beaters, go to interweave.com, go to their press room or just go to beatingdaily, all one word, dot com, and take a look. There's Beating Daily and Knitting Daily, which are like um, community-based emails that they're sending out to everyone to try and create a larger community of, in this case, beaters, also knitters. And I have a feeling that we're going to get more and more of those kinds of things coming out just in general. It's kind of along the Ravelry idea and um, the uh, knitting forum idea, uh, but it's all done with, with email that just comes straight from Interweave. The other thing about Interweave is I just got my fall 2007 Interweave knits and noticed that there is a new editor-in-chief and it's Uni. Uni of UniKnits.com and that's, I'm looking right now to, to see her thing. Uni Jang, she has, uh, she has become the editor-in-chief which is spectacular. She's, she, I don't know if you've ever seen her website, but my God, she is an extraordinary knitter and a very, very good teacher of knitting as well on her blog. It's, it's really a lot of fun and I've used her site more than once. So I'm very excited. And the Interweave Knits does have a different look to it. So that's kind of exciting. But now we need to move on to the real reason you're here <laughs> or one of the many reasons you're here. We have uh, three episodes crammed in tonight, all of them important, all of them interesting. And Irish Clover, who I've written back and forth with before, Susie, wrote, and I'm not going to give away everything that she wrote, but she said about last week, where I packed two very long episodes in, I found a few things interesting about the last two chapters, and if my assumptions are true, then the theme of sacrifice ships and is expanded by the actions of Carton and Madame Defarge. And oh, Susie, you couldn't be more right. Obviously, something's going on with Sydney Carton, but we also have Madame Defarge, and as Susie says, she is no longer acting through Repu for the Republic, but becomes just as evil as the men she is revenging. So tonight, we have our first of three, and I realize now that I've badly miscalculated, so I'm going to actually put out episode 64 and a half <laughs> along with this one, so that you can get all of... Uh, these three chapters. Also because next week I'm on vacation and one of our most loyal and wonderful listeners, Julie of Forgotten Classics, is filling in for me and she is going to do the podcast uh, for next week. So you will still get your episodes and you'll get Julie's spin on them, which I think is a pretty wonderful thing. So tonight our first chapter is called Dusk. Now last week, if you recall, um, all hell broke loose and disaster struck again. Not like, not like it doesn't keep doing that. We had uh, in in the last chapter, which was chapter ten, the substance of the shadow. We found out that Darnay's father and Darnay's uncle, the man who ran over the child with his carriage, are the people who are responsible for imprisoning 
Dr. Manette, and therefore Charles Darnay is in some strange, horrible way responsible for what happened to his father-in-law. And because of that, Manette's life is being used as a charge against Charles. So today, no big surprise, we have the celebration of Charles' um, condemnation, the, the fact that he is now, in fact, going to be executed. And this time, of course, the worst part is that there's no trump card. There's no way to get him out of it this time. There is only death, really, because Dr. Manette was his ace in the hole, and Dr. Manette cannot get him out of this. So this next chapter is only about 10 minutes long. It's very brief. It's called Dusk. The wretched wife of the innocent man thus doomed to die fell under the sentence as if she had been mortally stricken. But she uttered no sound, and so strong was the voice within her, representing that it was she of all the world who must uphold him in his misery, and not augment it, that it quickly raised her, even from that shock. The judges, having to take part in a public demonstration out of doors, the tribunal adjourned. The quick noise and movement of the court's emptying itself by many passengers had not ceased when Lucy stood stretching out her arms towards her husband with nothing in her face but love and consolation. If I might touch him, if I might embrace him once, oh, good citizens, if you would have so much compassion for us. There was but a jailer left, along with two of the four men who had taken him last night and Barsad. The people had all poured out to the show in the streets. Barsad proposed to the rest. Let her embrace him, then. It is but a moment. It was silently acquiesced in, and they passed her over the seats in the hall to a raised place, where he, by leaning over the dock, could fold her in his arms. Farewell, dear darling of my soul, my parting blessing on my love. We shall meet again, where the weary are at rest. They were her husband's words, as he held her to his bosom. I can bear it, dear Charles. I am supported from above. Don't suffer for me. A parting blessing for our child. I send it to her by you. I kiss her by you. I say farewell to her by you. My husband, no, a moment. He was tearing himself apart from her. We shall not be long separated. I feel that this will break my heart by and by. But I will do my duty while I can. And when I leave her, God will raise up friends for her as he did for me. Her father had followed her, and would have fallen on his knees to both of them, but that Darnay put out a hand and seized him, crying, No, no, what have you done, what have you done, that you should kneel to us? We know now what a struggle you have made of old. We know now what you underwent when you suspected my descent, and when you knew it. We know now the natural antipathy you strove against, and conquered for her dear sake. We thank you with all our hearts, and all our love and duty. Heaven be with you. Her father's only answer was to draw his hands through his white hair, and wring them with a shriek of anguish. It could not be otherwise, said the prisoner. All things have worked together as they have fallen out. It was the always vain endeavor to discharge my poor mother's trust that first brought my fatal presence near you. Good could never come of such evil and a happier end was not in nature to so unhappy a beginning. Be comforted, and forgive me. Heaven bless you. As he was drawn away, his wife released him, and stood looking after him with her hands touching one another in the attitude of prayer, and with a radiant look upon her face, in which there was even a comforting smile. As he went out at the prisoner's door, she turned, laid her head lovingly on her father's breast, tried to speak to him, and fell at his feet. Then issuing from the obscure corner from which he had never moved, Sidney Carton came and took her up. Only her father and Mr. Lorry were with her. His arm trembled as it raised her, and supported her head. Yet there was an air about him that was not all of pity, that had a flush of pride in it. Shall I take her to a coach? I shall never feel her weight. He carried her lightly to the door, and laid her tenderly down in a coach. Her father and their old friend got into it, and he took his seat beside the driver. 
when they arrived at the gateway where he had paused in the dark not many hours before to picture to himself on which of the rough stones of the street her feet had trodden he lifted her again and carried her up the staircase to their rooms there he laid her down on a couch where her child and miss pross wept over her don't recall her to herself he said softly to the latter she is better so don't revive her to consciousness while she only faints oh carton carton dear carton cried little lucy springing up and throwing her arms passionately round him in a burst of grief now that you have come i think you will do something to help mamma something to save papa oh look at her dear carton can you of all people who love her bear to see her so he bent over the child and laid her blooming cheek against his face he put her gently from him and looked at her unconscious mother before i go he said and paused i may kiss her it was remembered afterwards that when he bent down and touched her face with his lips he murmured some words the child who was nearest to him told them afterwards and told her grandchildren when she was a handsome old lady that she heard him say a life you love when he had gone out into the next room he turned suddenly on mr lorry and her father who were following and said to the latter you had great influence but yesterday dr manette let it at least be tried these judges and all the men in power are very friendly to you and very recognizant of your services are they not nothing connected with charles was concealed from me i had the strongest assurances that i should save him and i did he returned the answer in great trouble and very slowly try them again the hours between this and tomorrow afternoon are few and short but try i intend to try i will not rest a moment that's well i have known such energy as yours do great things before now though never he added with a smile and a sigh together such great things as this but try of little worth as life is when we misuse it it is worth that effort it would cost nothing to lay down if it were not i will go said dr manette to the prosecutor and the president straight and i will go to others whom it is better not to name i will write too and but stay there is a celebration in the streets and no one will be accessible until dark that's true well it is a forlorn hope at best and not much more the forlorner for being delayed till dark i should like to know how you speed though mind i expect nothing when are you likely to have seen these dread powers dr manette immediately after dark i should hope within an hour or two from this it will be dark soon after four let us stretch the hour or two if i go to mr lorry's at nine shall i hear what you have done either from our friend or from yourself yes may you prosper mr lorry followed sydney to the outer door and touching him on the shoulder as he was going away caused him to turn i have no hope said mr lorry in a low and sorrowful whisper nor have i if any one of these men or all of these men were disposed to spare him which is a large supposition for what is his life or any man's to them i doubt if they durst spare him after the demonstration in the court and so do i i heard the fall of the axe in that sound mr lorry leaned his arm upon the doorpost and bowed his face upon it don't despond said carton very gently don't grieve i encouraged dr manette in this idea because i felt that it might one day be consolatory to her otherwise she might think his life was want only thrown away or wasted and that might trouble her yes yes returned mr lorry drying his eyes you are right but he will perish there is no real hope yes he will perish there is no real hope echoed carton and walked with a settled step downstairs yeah, I know she wasn't the greatest reader, but clearly something's going on with Carton. And just to uh, bring back to memory, he whispers a life you love to Lucy. Well, remember back years ago, he said to her, there is a man who would give his life 
to keep a life you love beside you. So when he says he will perish, there is no real hope. Now it should make you think. Sidney Carton's uh, character looks even stronger and more solid, I think, in the midst of all the, the melodrama between Lucy and Darnay. And we've seen this before. Whenever you get kind of heightened passion in this particular book of Dickens, it, it kind of falls into the melodramatic, hand-wringing, wailing, I love you, no, I love you, kind of thing. And it just kind of gets over the top. But again, that was expected then. It's only us cynical, ironic, modern people who watch YouTube that, um, that find fault with that. So, you know, you kind of have to put it in its place. But definitely something's up with Sydney. Our next chapter is called Darkness. So the last one was Dusk. This one's Darkness. And you've already heard that uh, Dr. Manette was not going to be able to get a hold of anyone until Darkness fell because everybody was going to be out in the streets partying because Charles is going to get killed. So now we have Sidney Carton on the prowl actively working to try to save Darnay. And uh, we also have some more Mr. Lorry uh, trying to help him out. So listen to the descriptions of Carton and what he's up to. In this, our next chapter, chapter 12, Darkness. Sidney Carton paused in the street, not quite decided where to go. At Telson's banking house, at nine, he said, with a musing face. Shall I do well in the meantime to show myself? I think so. It is best that these people should know that there is such a man as I here. It is a sound precaution, and may be a necessary preparation. But care, care, care. Let me think it out. Checking his steps, which had begun to tend towards an object, he took a turn or two in the already darkening street, and traced the thought in his mind to its possible consequences. His first impression was confirmed. It is best, he said, finally resolved, that these people should know that there is such a man as I here. And he turned his face towards St. Antoine. Defarge had described himself that day as the keeper of a wine shop in the St. Antoine suburb. It was not difficult for one who knew the city well to find his house without asking any question. Having ascertained its situation, Carlton came out of those closer streets again and dined at a place of refreshment, and fell sound asleep after dinner. For the first time in many years he had no strong drink. Since last night he had taken nothing but a little light thin wine. And last night he dropped the brandy slowly down on Mr. Lorry's hearth like a man who had done with it. It was as late as seven o'clock when he awoke refreshed, and went out into the streets again. As he passed along towards St. Antoine, he stopped at a shop window where there was a mirror, and slightly altered the disordered arrangement of his loose cravat, and his coat collar, and his wild hair. This done, he went on direct to Defarge's, and went in. There happened to be no customer in the shop but Jacques Three, of the restless fingers and the croaking voice. This man, whom he had seen upon the jury, stood drinking at the little counter, in conversation with the Defarges, man and wife. The vengeance assisted in the conversation like a regular member of the establishment. As Carton walked in, took his seat, and asked, in very indifferent French, for a small measure of wine, Madame Defarge cast a careless glance at him, and then a keener, and then a keener, and then advanced to him herself, and asked him what it was he had ordered. He repeated what he had already said. English, asked Madame Defarge, inquisitively raising her dark eyebrows. After looking at her as if the sound of even a single French word were slow to express itself to him, he answered in his former strong foreign accent, Yes, Madame, yes, I am English. Madame Defarge, returned to her counter to get the wine, and, as he took up a Jacobin journal and feigned to pour over it, puzzling out its meaning, he heard her say, I swear to you, like Evremond, 
Defarge brought him the wine, and gave him good evening. How? Good evening. Oh, good evening, citizen, filling his glass. Ah, and good wine. I drink to the Republic. Defarge went back to the counter and said, Certainly a little like. Madame sternly retorted, I tell you, a good deal like. Jacques III pacifically remarked, He is so much in your mind, you see, madame. The amiable vengeance added with a laugh, Yes, my faith, and you are looking forward with so much pleasure to seeing him once more to-morrow. Carton followed the lines and words of his paper with a slow forefinger, and with a studious and absorbed face. They were all leaning their arms on the counter close together, speaking low. After a silence of a few moments, during which they all looked towards him without disturbing his outward attention from the Jacobin editor, they resumed their conversation. Why stop? There is great force in that. Why stop? Well, well, reasoned Defarge, but one must stop somewhere. After all, the question is still where. At extermination, said Madame. Magnificent, croaked Jacques Three. The vengeance also highly approved. Extermination is good doctrine, my wife, said Defarge, rather troubled. In general, I say nothing against it. But this doctor has suffered much. You have seen him to-day. You have observed his face when the paper was read. I have observed his face, repeated Madame, contemptuously and angrily. Yes, I have observed his face. I have observed his face to be not the face of a true friend of the Republic. Let him take care of his face. And you have observed, my wife, said Defarge, in a deprecatory manner, the anguish of his daughter, which must be a dreadful anguish to him. I have observed his daughter, repeated Madame. Yes, I have observed his daughter more times than one. I have observed her to-day, and I have observed her other days. I have observed her in the court, and I have observed her in the street by the prison. Let me but lift my finger. She seemed to raise it. The listener's eyes were always on his paper. And to let it fall with a rattle on the ledge before her, as if the axe had dropped. The citizeness is superb, croaked the juryman. She is an angel, said the vengeance, and embraced her. As to thee, pursued Madame, implacably addressing her husband, if it depended on thee, which happily it does not, thou wouldst rescue this man even now. No, protested Defarge, not if to lift this glass would do it. But I would leave the matter there. I say stop there. See you then, Jacques, said Madame Defarge wrathfully, and see you too, my little vengeance, see you both. Listen, for other crimes as tyrants and oppressors I have this race a long time on my register, doomed to destruction and extermination. Ask my husband, is that so? It is so, assented Defarge, without being asked. In the beginning of the great days, when the Bastille falls, he finds this paper of to-day, and he brings it home, and in the middle of the night, when this place is clear and shut, we read it. Here on this spot, by the light of this lamp, ask him, is that so? It is so, assented Defarge. That night, I tell him, when the paper is read through, and the lamp is burnt out, and the day is gleaming in above those shutters and between those iron bars, that I have now a secret to communicate. Ask him, is that so? It is so, assented Defarge again. I communicate to him that secret. I smite this bosom with these two hands as I smite it now, and I tell him, Defarge, I was brought up among the fishermen of the seashore. And that peasant family so injured by those two Evremond brothers, as that Bastille paper describes, is my family. Defarge, that sister of the mortally wounded boy upon the ground, was my sister. That husband was my sister's husband. That unborn child was their child. That brother was my brother. That father was my father. Those are my dead. And that summons to answer for those things descends to me. Ask him, is that so? It is so, assented Defarge, once more. Then tell wind and fire where to stop, returned Madame, but don't tell me. Both her hearers derived a horrible enjoyment from the deadly nature of her wrath. The listener could feel how white she was without seeing her, 
and both highly commended it. Defarge, a weak minority, interposed a few words for the memory of the compassionate wife of the Marquis, but only elicited from his own wife a repetition of her last reply. Tell the wind and the fire where to stop, not me. Customers entered, and the group was broken up. The English customer paid for what he had had, perplexedly counted his change, and asked, as a stranger, to be directed towards the National Palace. Madame Defarge took him to the door, and put her arm on his in pointing out the road. The English customer was not without his reflections, then, that it might be a good deed to seize that arm, lift it, and strike under it sharp and deep. But he went his way, and was soon swallowed up in the shadow of the prison wall. At the appointed hour he emerged from it to present himself in Mr. Lorry's room again, where he found the old gentleman walking to and fro in restless anxiety. He said he had been with Lucy until just now, and had only left her for a few minutes to come and keep his appointment. Her father had not been seen since he quitted the banking-house towards four o'clock. She had some faint hopes that his mediation might save Charles, but they were very slight. He had been more than five hours gone. Where could he be? Mr. Lorry waited until ten, but Dr. Manat not returning, and he, being unwilling to leave Lucy any longer, it was arranged that he should go back to her, and come to the banking-house again at midnight. In the meantime, Carton would wait alone by the fire for the doctor. He waited, and waited, and the clock struck twelve, but Dr. Manette did not come back. Mr. Lorry returned and found no tidings of him, and brought none. Where could he be? They were discussing this question, and were almost building up some weak structure of hope on his prolonged absence when they heard him on the stairs. The instant he entered the room it was plain that all was lost. Whether he had been to any one, or whether he had been all that time traversing the streets, was never known. As he stood staring at them they asked him no questions, for his face told them everything. "'I cannot find it,' said he, "'and I must have it. Where is it?' His head and throat were bare, and, as he spoke with a helpless look straying all around, he took his coat off and let it drop to the floor. "'Where is my bench? I have been looking everywhere for my bench, and I can't find it. What have they done with my work? Time presses. I must finish those shoes.' They looked at one another, and their hearts died within them. "'Come, come,' he said, in a whimpering, miserable way. "'Let me get to work. Give me my work.' Receiving no answer, he tore his hair and beat his feet upon the ground, like a distracted child. "'Don't torture a poor, forlorn wretch,' he implored them, with a dreadful cry. "'But give me my work. What is to become of us if those shoes are not done to-night?' Lost, utterly lost. It was so clearly beyond hope to reason with him, or try to restore him, that, as if by agreement, they each put a hand upon his shoulder— and soothed him to sit down before the fire, with a promise that he should have his work presently. He sank into the chair and brooded over the embers, and shed tears. As if all that had happened since the garret time were a momentary fancy or a dream, Mr. Lorry saw him shrink into the exact figure that Defarge had had in keeping. Affected and impressed with terror as they both were, by this spectacle of ruin, it was not a time to yield to such emotions. His lonely daughter, bereft of her final hope and reliance, appealed to them both too strongly. Again, as if by agreement, they looked at one another, with one meaning in their faces. Carton was the first to speak. The last chance is gone. It was not much. Yes, he had better be taken to her. But before you go, will you for a moment steadily attend to me? Don't ask me why I make the stipulations I am going to make, and exact the promise I am going to exact. I have a reason, a good one. I do not doubt it, answered Mr. Lorry. Say on. The figure in the chair between them was all the time monotonously rocking itself to and fro and moaning. They spoke in such a tone as they would have used if they had been watching by a sick bed in the night. Carton stooped to pick up the coat which lay almost entangling his feet. As he did so, a small case, in which the doctor was accustomed to carry the lists of his day's duties, fell lightly to the floor. Carton took it up, and there was a folded paper in it. "'We should look at this,' he said. Mr. Lorry nodded his consent. He opened it and exclaimed, "'Thank God!' 
"'What is it?' asked Mr. Lorry eagerly. "'A moment. Let me speak of it in its place. First, he put his hand in his coat and took another paper from it. That is the certificate which enables me to pass out of this city. Look at it, you see. Sidney Carton, an Englishman. Mr. Lorry held it open in his hand, gazing in his earnest face. Keep it for me until tomorrow. I shall see him tomorrow, you remember, and I had better not take it into the prison. Why not? I don't know. I prefer not to do so. Now take this paper that Dr. Minette has carried about him. It is a similar certificate, enabling him and his daughter and her child at any time to pass the barrier and the frontier, you see? Yes. Perhaps he obtained it as his last and utmost precaution against evil yesterday. When is it dated? But no matter. Don't stay to look. Put it up carefully with mine and your own. Now observe, I never doubted until within this hour or two that he had or could have had such a paper. It is good until recalled, but it may be soon recalled, and I have reason to think will be. They are not in danger. They are in great danger. They are in danger of denunciation by Madame Defarge. I know it from her own lips. I have overheard words of that woman's, to-night, which have presented their danger to me in strong colours. I have lost no time, and since then I have seen the spy. He confirms me. He knows that a wood-sawyer, living by the prison wall, is under the control of the Defarges, and has been rehearsed by Madame Defarge as to his having seen her, he never mentioned Lucy's name, making signs and signals to prisoners. It is easy to foresee that the pretense will be the common one. A prison plot, and that it will involve her life, and perhaps her child's, and perhaps her father's, for both have been seen with her at that place. Don't look so horrified. You will save them all. Heaven grant I may, Carton, but how? I am going to tell you how. It will depend on you, and it could depend on no better man. This new denunciation will certainly not take place until after to-morrow, probably not until two or three days afterwards, probably a week afterwards. You know, it is a capital crime to mourn for or sympathize with a victim of the guillotine. She and her father would unquestionably be guilty of this crime, and this woman, the inveteracy of whose pursuit cannot be described, would wait to add that strength to her case and make herself doubly sure. You follow me? So attentively, and with so much confidence in what you say, that for a moment I lose sight, touching the back of the doctor's chair, even of this distress. You have money and can buy the means of travelling to the sea-coast as quickly as the journey can be made. Your preparations have been completed for some days to return to England. Early to-morrow have your horses ready, so that they may be in starting trim at two o'clock in the afternoon. It shall be done. His manner was so fervent and inspiring that Mr. Lorry caught the flame and was as quick as youth. You are a noble heart. Did I say we could depend on no better man? Tell her to-night what you know of her danger as involving her child and her father. Dwell upon that for she would lay her own fair head beside her husband's cheerfully. He faltered for an instant, and then went on as before. For the sake of her child and her father, press upon her the necessity of leaving Paris, with them and you, at that hour. Tell her that it was her husband's last arrangement. Tell her that more depends on it than she dare believe or hope. You think her father, even in this sad state, will submit himself to her, do you not? I am sure of it. I thought so. Quietly and steadily have all these arrangements made in the courtyard here, even to the taking of your own seat in the carriage. The moment I come to you, take me in and drive away. I understand that I wait for you under all circumstances. You have my certificate in your hand with the rest, you know, and will reserve my place. Wait for nothing but to have my place occupied, and then for England." Why then, said Mr. Lorry, grasping his eager but so firm and steady hand, it does not all depend on one old man, but I shall have a young and ardent man at my side. By the help of heaven you shall. Promise me solemnly that nothing will influence you to alter the course on which we now stand pledged to one another. Nothing, Carton. Remember these words to-morrow. Change the course, or delay in it, for any reason, and no life 
can possibly be saved, and many lives must inevitably be sacrificed. I will remember them. I hope to do my part faithfully, and I hope to do mine. Now good-bye. Though he said it with a grave smile of earnestness, and though he even put the old man's hand to his lips, he did not part from him then. He helped him so far to arouse the rocking figure before the dying embers, as to get a cloak and a hat put upon it, and to tempt it forth to find where the bench and work were hidden that it still moaningly besought to have. He walked on the other side of it and protected it to the courtyard of the house where the afflicted heart, so happy in the memorable time when he had revealed his own desolate heart to it, outwatched the awful night. He entered the courtyard and remained there for a few moments alone looking up at the light in the window of her room. Before he went away, he breathed a blessing towards it, and a farewell. End of Book 3, Chapter 12 There you have it. The final big surprise of, well, no, it's actually the second to the last big surprise of the book. So now you know why Madame Defarge is the way she is. It was her sister who was raped by the brothers Evremont, and who, um, whose entire family was completely ripped apart and traumatized by their, their doings. Um, and this is also where Dickens, I think, does something really brilliant. We have seen how outrageous and horrifyingly brutal the aristocracy has been towards the people. Um, the, the brutality of, you know, running over a child and then throwing, throwing a few coins out the window is unimaginable to me. I don't, I don't really comprehend how humans can do things like that to other humans. I've never been able to understand that, not since I was a child, and I still don't get it. At the same time, Dickens is clearly trying to show that while Madame Defarge has a reason to be angry, she is, by stretching to, by, by stretching her vengeance, from the brothers Evremon who have been killed, well, one of whom died and then the other one, the uncle, has been killed, uh, stretching it to Charles, who has never demonstrated any of the tendencies of his uncle or his father, and has in fact only shown a good heart and kind of a valorous uh, stance in, in everything, you know, coming back to France to save a servant, which is, you know, knowing what he was getting himself into is all the more shocking. Um, she's not She's not willing to just stop with killing Charles. She wants Lucy and their daughter. It's that kind of rabid revenge, thoughtless revenge, that's just bloodlust that Dickens clearly has a problem with. It's, it's not just the mob thing. It's when the peasants become as violent And he certainly does a wonderful job saving Madame Defarge's secret until here, until the end, uh, when we're only, what, three three more chapters away from the end of the book? woo -hoo! So I cannot fit a 23-minute 23, 23 minute and 52-second chapter into this podcast because GarageBand won't let me go that long. So I am going to create Craftlet episode 64A, and I'm going to record that right now so that I'll upload both of them, uh, which means the player on the Blogspot site and the player on the Libsyn site will wind up only playing 64A. So I need to make some kind of disclaimer about that at the beginning of it, that if you haven't listened to 64A, don't listen to 64. If you haven't listened to 64 proper, don't listen to 64A first. All right, enough blather. I'm going to stop this podcast and begin the podcast for chapter 13, which is called 52. So until five minutes from now, <laughs> when I'll talk to you again, have a great night. You can find a blog for this podcast at craftlit.blogspot.com or craftlit.libsyn.com. That's craftlit, C-R-A-F-T-L-I-T, all one word, and libsyn, L-I-B-S-Y-N. And of course, you can subscribe at iTunes.
Craftlit is supported by the generous donations of its listeners, and for that, I am truly grateful. And do remember, if your hands are too busy to pick up a book, at least you can turn one on.